real estate is about freedom, choice freedom, time freedom, and money freedom, and the impact you can make with that freedom. But it doesn't come without cost. Your freedom takes work. That's why Neil Timmons brings together the tools you need to build your real estate legacy, from tips and tricks to interviews with industry titans. It's all here in one place. Real Grit. Let's get to it. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Real Grit. I'm Neil Timmons. I'm excited to have Cale Delaney here. Uh, let me give you a little of his background. He went to work right out of college in commercial real estate as a broker. Uh, that was in the 2006 era. And right after the crash in 2008, he went into construction management. He still works there as a senior project manager, has won multiple international project awards. He's been investing now for about two years. He's got a total of 11 units, including five cabins in the Smoky Mountains, a beautiful section of this country I haven't been to. Uh, he's grown his portfolio for about 300000 in value to over $4 million. He's replaced a six-figure income. He's grown his net worth to become a multimillionaire in less than two years. So I'm excited to have him here. It's going to be a fun story. Gail, how are you? Welcome. Good. Good, Neil. Great. Thank you very much for the invite. Yeah, you bet. So tell me, we all have a different journey in terms of how we stepped into this industry. You got into it right after college. What prompted you to, to enter the real estate industry? Yeah, uh, you know, right after college, uh, when I was studying engineering, just through internships and, and whatnot, I kind of realized it really it wasn't what I wanted to do. And I started just getting an interest in, in investing in general and a little bit specifically into real estate. Yeah. And so I had started actually working part-time for this brokerage my, my senior year and then just went full-time into it afterwards. And I was just kind of following the money, so to speak, and that you just look at who's wealthy and right. more often than not, it's it has something to do with real estate. So I figured let's get something, let's get going something in that realm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was a learning experience. You know, I did not enjoy the brokerage aspect of it. Uh, I met some really great, great people, learned a lot. And, you know, it was just a, a bad timing thing. Um, you know, once uh, 2008 rolled around right? Um, and, and, you know, not being in love with that specific aspect of the real estate industry. Uh, and so I, I, I put it on hold, you know, yeah. as I jumped ship into construction management yeah. and didn't pick it up until, like you mentioned, about uh, you know two years ago, which yeah. is you know what is that, fifteen years later right, or something. Right, right, right. Well, tell me and, this. I got two questions for you on this point. What had you choose the commercial real estate industry as your entry point to real estate to a job versus residential? I think it just was. It kind of bigger is better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah, I think that was really it. It was a little bit. It seemed a little bit more glamorous than residential real estate because you know you're dealing with investors yeah, right. and not people just looking to buy a home right. for themselves. Right. What had, uh, you mentioned you, you didn't care for it. It wasn't, it wasn't, a it wasn't a true love for you. Why? Cold calling. Mm, yeah. <laughs> that I would say would be the number one thing. Uh, yeah, I did not enjoy the cold calling and it's, you know, uh, with that industry in general, you know, whether it's being a real estate sales agent, a broker or whatever, you know, you're, you're, your time is your, is your value. Right. And Correct. so you're, you're going to be dealing with a lot of tire kickers and, and people that are not going to value your time right. uh, as they should. And so it gets a little frustrating yeah. and just with the market conditions at, at that time, it wasn't as lucrative as, you know, I kind of had hoped it was, it was going to be. And so it just really didn't make sense for me anymore once the market dried up. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It was a very challenging environment to be in. And then certainly in there in Florida, I had another right friend of mine growing up with him um, who was in there in Florida at that time. No, I totally understand. It was a tough spot for everybody to be in. All right. right so you go on this hi hiatus and you decide to get back in. What was the gen genesis of that to get back in? Yeah, that really was the birth of my son. You know, he's uh, a little over two and a half years old right now. And, you know, after he was born, it was just kind of a real, real 180 degree shift in everything, even just from my schedule. I mean, sure. it went from, you know, go to work, come home in the evening, go to the gym, have dinner, go to bed yeah. to, okay, well, if I want to be able to do any of that stuff, it has to happen before work. So now, you know, it's right. getting up at 5 a.m., going yeah. to the gym, taking care of all this stuff before work. So I can spend time with the family afterwards, <laughs> you know, so it started with that and, and yeah. it just got me thinking of you know, I need to start building something for yeah. the future for my family. And, and, you know, I just, I can't be an employee for the rest of my life here. That was your firstborn. That was my firstborn. Yeah. Um, we have, uh, we have two older uh, kids uh, yeah. that are my wife's from previous marriage, yeah. but yeah. Uh, yeah, he was our first, uh, first together and my first. It's born, so not the same with a newborn, is it? 
It is not the same. <laughs> my, uh, my brother is having his first. He is, uh, he's, I mean, they're, they're a couple of days past due at this point. So he's, he's, you know, he's keeping me apprised of what's going on and them prepping and everything. And, uh, so he, he keeps saying, like, we don't know how many we want to have, et cetera, et cetera. He said, you know, all my friends tell me that going from one to two, that's like the game changer. And I have three. And, I, and he's like, he's like, it seems like go to two to three for would be the game changer. Cause you go from man to man to, to zone defense. I said, Hey, I don't know which one of those is true, but I can tell you going from zero to one. That, that's it. That'll, right. that's the one that changes your world upside down forever yeah. and never come back from it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. A lot of positives, of course, but you're right. It's, it's, uh, how do I get things done? How do I, it just, you have a new, a new norm, right? right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. For some people who don't know enough about the short-term rental industry, maybe, you know, what are the top two or three things they should know if they're considering going into it? Sure. From the pro side, it is probably the best asset class in real estate for the amount of return that you can generate. I mean, for cash flow, again, I, I just don't think there's another asset class that can beat it. So it's it's an excellent investment to turbocharge your cash flow if that's what your goal is. Yep. From the con side, it is not passive. You know, it is an active type of investing. Yep. You know, it it does take work. Now, there's a great variety of how much or how little time you put in, and you can put in as little as you want or as much as you want but it is going to take some work. It's not as bad as you may think, but it's not going to be totally carefree and, and as little as a long-term rental or something like that might be. So I would say those are probably the, the two main things. And then maybe just the third would be that you have to commit to that industry or that business because it's a hospitality mm. business yep. is what it is. And so you are delivering a service to people and you uh, they have expectations, right? And so you need to understand that you are going to have to deal with people, guests, um, that may be demanding, right? That some may be gracious, some may be not so gracious, um, but that is the, the business that you've chosen if you if you choose to get into short term. I think the best way I've heard it described is you don't have tenants, you have customers. It, there you go, exactly. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay. What's financing look like on a on one of those? Just, uh, so there's, just, just traditional? Yeah, there's, there's lots of, right, uh, yeah. of op options out there, just yeah. like anything. Um, one of the best uh, products that, that you can get and that, that a lot of people utilize is, you know, your, your first property in a separate market, you can utilize a second home loan. Second home loan, yeah. And you can get in with 10% down. And, you know, it's conventional financing. So the terms are 30 or fixed, still, yeah. you know, decent rates. You know, of course, rates are, are, you know, increasing at this time. So that that's a popular product that people utilize for the first mm -hmm. one. And then you can keep repeating using that as long as it's in a different market. But beyond that, uh, me personally, I've used just standard, you know, again, conventional investment loans with 15% down because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still in all pretty much the same market. But uh yeah, there's other ones which I'm getting into at this point because my, you know, I've tapped out on my, my debt to income ratio, but right. there's debt service coverage ratio or DSCR loans that just look at the property's income and not your debt to income ratio. So there's lots of different options out there. Yeah, no, that's great. Tell, let's circle back to management. It's hands-on, if you will. Mm -hmm. How do you handle that? You don't physically live in the same, you don't live in the Smoky Mountains. You're 16 hours away, right? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Pedal to the metal 16 hours away. How do you manage it? How do you handle it? Technology is your friend. So the beauty of it really is that as long as you have, you know, this little thing right here, yeah. you can manage it from anywhere in the world, which is a really amazing, amazing thing that it, that it allows you that freedom. So there's, there's certain software that are going to be essential, you know, a, a dynamic pricing software, which changes the pricing on a daily basis based on market demand and factors yeah. that's critical. And then a, a PMS or property management system, which is going to sync your calendars between the different platforms like Airbnb and Verbo, you know, have the abilities for automated communication and messaging and, and all these various other things. So, but those really, with those two pieces of software, I mean, it, it can really automate 90% yeah. of, of the whole process. And from there, it's a matter of, then getting your boots on the ground. So having cleaner and your handyman, and then, you know, some of the various, various other specialty contractors, you're going to need plumbing, electrical, whatnot. So having those contacts and having your, your solid cleaner and, and handyman, again, it's not as bad as you or as scary as you might think yeah. with managing something out of town. It's, it's actually, I much prefer that than to yeah. having something local. You know? A friend of mine said this, I don't know, maybe like 
I, I think I owned just a handful of single family homes at one at, at, at the time he told me this. He said, uh, I own so many single family homes now that I will go out of my way not to drive past the house. <laughs> Because exactly. inevitably, inevitably, you're going to see something because they don't maintain it like you. You're going to see something. You're going to want to call your management team and you're going to want to have something done and you're going yeah. to spend up spending money yeah. and just to make yourself feel better. It, yeah. It's 100 percent true. I'm, and in fact, right now, I'm actually I'm sitting in the uh, the one short term rental that we have locally here in yeah. South Florida. Because like I said, we got three kids, so there's no peace and quiet in my house. So. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but yeah, exactly that. You know, you walk in the door and you're just looking, you're like, oh, what I know there's something that they didn't take care yeah. of. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Yeah, totally right. How challenging was it in order to find the cleaner in order to find the handyman? It is challenging. It yeah. is challenging. And each market is different. You know, something that's very heavily tourist market like the Smokies yeah. um, or some other of these, you know, hot vacation markets. <laughs> The, the good thing is that the infrastructure is there and that there's more cleaners or handyman than you could possibly want. Right. The challenge is there's not a lot of good quality ones. So, uh, you know, it's very difficult to know if you're getting a quality one or not. So in fact, just yesterday, uh, I had to fire one of my cleaners, bring on another one. So yeah. it is, it does happen. There is some turnover um, and, and that is challenging. But again, if you're in a market where there's a plethora of people, it's just a matter of trial and error. This one locally here, it's not in a very popular short-term rental market. Um, there's a few. So it was difficult finding a cleaner that knows how to do a short-term rental clean. It's right. very different the than, yeah. right. So we actually had to train them and I get it. They're awesome. I mean, they're, I wish they were in Tennessee. I mean, they're, yeah. they're fantastic here. Yeah. So it kind of does have that benefit. If you can train some, somebody right. to do it the way you, you like. Right. It almost is easier than, than finding somebody who's kind of already got it ingrained, you know, in their habits and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to me through the course of, you know, the last two years building this from starting with the four unit to, to get into the portfolio where it's at today, you know, from the outside looking in, everybody would go, well, he's just, he's killing it. He's doing great. But I know from, from doing it myself and from talking to everybody in the industry, you know, it's not that easy. There's always bumps right. and, and bruises and you, and you kind of learn things as you go. Have you been faced with any challenges that you've had to overcome? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I've been on a, a, a few podcasts and I'm active in some various forum, you know, real estate investor forums and stuff. I've kept it kind of close to the chest on, on some of the, the personal challenges that, that, you know, we've had throughout these past couple of years. But, you know, I thought that this uh, podcast, I mean, being re named Real Grit, you right. know, it might be the opportune time to kind of share a little bit of it to hopefully encourage some people because it, Getting into this industry, if you're truly looking to make a life-changing, life-changing change, life -changing change yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's going to take a lot of sacrifice, number one, you know, so you got to be prepared for that. You got to have a strong why, you know, your reason that you're doing it, because when those challenges come up, man, it's, it's easy to quit, right? It's easy to just say enough of this and, and walk away. Right. Um, so you got to have a strong why that you're doing it to, to get through this and, you know, so not, not to go through a ton of, you know, give a ton of detail, but so like I said, in June of 2020, we closed on that fourplex. Yeah. And then in February, 2021, we closed on the next deal, which was the first cabin in the Smoky Mountains. Yeah. And then March of 2021, we converted uh, this unit that I'm in right now, which was a long-term into a short-term rental. And in the middle of that conversion, you know, which, which my wife and I were doing on our, on our own, you know, coming over in the evenings and, you know, painting and setting up furniture and whatnot. My wife, yeah, you know, she's from Ecuador and she had planned to go to, to Ecuador for a couple of weeks. It's supposed to be two weeks. Sure. And um, during that time, you know, she ended up having a medical procedure done there and it went bad. And so what was supposed to be a two week trip for her actually ended up being four and a half months that she was stuck in Ecuador through some really terrible uh, situations. Um, you know, uh, she ended up having to get two more surgeries there um, mm -hmm. that were still bad. And so in the meantime, you know, uh, like I, said, I was in the middle of converting this one unit, just mm -hmm. got this other cabin up and running. We were under contract on two more cabins. I've got three kids. I'm working my W2. And now we've got this thrown in our path here. Yeah. And so that was a point where it would have been very easy to say, okay, <laughs> you know, there's too much going on right now. Right. We need to pump the brakes right. and, you know, uh, we'll get to this later. No one would have blamed you. Right. Exactly. 
but I was, I was so set in my mind that, and I had seen already the fruits and seen that this could get us to where we wanted to be. Yep. That I couldn't turn back on it. So, I mean, we were, thank God I was able to get some help. You know, we actually flew in my father-in-law from Ecuador for a couple months to, to help out with sure. the kids. Yeah. We ended up sending our two older kids for a period up with my parents in New Hampshire because the kids were doing school online at that time with COVID. Right. And, but, you know, there was a period where it was me alone with our two-year-old trying to work a W-2, trying to manage these cabins, trying to set things up and take care of a two-year-old by myself. And so it was a very extremely stressful time. And then even after those four and a half months, when my wife was finally able to come back, literally the day that she came back and I saw what her condition was, yeah. uh, we went to the emergency room. It was that bad. And so it's almost a year later from this and I, you know, we're still dealing with this. She just had two more surgeries. So it's been a, a real terrible, you know, personal journey through this past year, but you know, we've still stuck through this and we've turned that year. I mean, we, we put on, we added on four more, four more right. cabins. So I bring that up at this point, you know, like I said, I kept it, I've kept it kind of more close to the chest, but I bring it up at this point because, you know, I don't find my story particularly uh, special or inspirational, you know, myself, but people have come to me when they hear my story and they say it's encouraged them and inspired them to, you know, finally get going or, or, or whatever. And so I felt it's, it, it was kind of necessary to share some of the real, the true life, you know, behind the scenes struggles that people really go through, because when you hear it on a podcast or on forums or something, you know, it's mainly successes that you're hearing about, right? I mean, you're hearing about this great deal that you got, or, you know, you whatever, all well, this, you just made this every, sale or whatever. Every, everything on Facebook is a success. Right. Exactly. You right. know, and you never hear the real struggles or right. the real sacrifices right. that people yep. have to make to, right. to get there. So, you know, again, I bring it up, not as any type of pat myself on the shoulder more for people who are going through stuff because everybody's got their stuff. Yeah. No, right. every, everybody's got their stuff. You're totally right about that. You, you open with getting into this industry it's not necessarily easy and you got to have a big why. And he who has a, um, what did Nietzsche say? If you've got a big enough why, you can you can conquer anyhow. Right. So my question to you is, what what was your why? Because you made it through a lot of how. Yeah. My why was uh, was my son. And getting out of, you know, he, he's the end, the end goal, right? The, yeah. You know, the intermediate steps, you know, we're getting out of my W2, getting financially free. Yeah. So that, you know, I can spend time with him and that we can, you know, have experiences, we can travel, we can have freedom, yeah. you know, so that, that ultimately was, was my why. Um, and I knew that if I gave up, you know, I, I had made it far enough to like, again, see the fruits and see a clear yeah. path that if I gave up at that time, it was going to be so hard to get back into it. Yeah. And I would have so much regret and so much guilt for doing that, yeah. that it would just be you know so much worse off. Did you, do you think that if you had given up, you would have been failing your son? Yes, absolutely. Do you think that's that the birth of your son, then, you know, you, you've got a gap where you, where you touched the industry and then, you know, didn't enter back in the industry until you, until you were doing it for another person that you value, um, you know, ultimately, you know, like so many parents, you value your son really greater than you valued yourself. Oh, yes, absolutely. That, that absolutely. Other, otherwise you would have perhaps done it, done it sooner. I mean, the why is that big? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I kind of go to the extreme on some things, you know, it's uh, like I said, I jumped into this real estate and really yeah. scaled things pretty quickly. I mean, yes. I, I went, you know, my family, I, uh, you know, went from uh, in a period of two years, went from single to married with three kids <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of a lot of very fast-paced life-changing events you know over the past several years yeah. and um you know i think back that yeah when i was single uh, there's not much to think about right i mean right. yeah you can think about your future and i've always been very fiscally responsible and, sure. and, and things like that but there wasn't a real pressing motivation to say, Hey, I need to get out of my W2 and find financial freedom. Right. It was, right. I could, I could survive as a W2 employee sure. for the perpetual future. Right. right? But once you get that family, once you get those kids and you start seeing people who are 10, 20, 30 years ahead of you, yep. and they're still in that same job they're they need that job. And if something yep. happens to that job, they're, they're in bad shape. 
right uh, you know and to see that and be like yeah this can't happen i mean i i can't live like that i can't i can't have that future and i think there's always a historical there's a giant knock on on w2s it's not that w2 is a bad thing it's right. that it's that your inability to have the freedom to get out of that should you so choose that's the problem that right. i mean that's that's the bad piece do whatever you love if it's a w it doesn't matter what it is Oh, absolutely. But, but anybody being stuck in a spot where they don't want to be doing what they do, but they have to do it. That is, that's a tough rock. Right. 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 Yeah. And you're absolutely right. I mean, if you're in a W2 that you enjoy, I mean, by all means, keep Wonderful. going at it as Correct. long as you can. You know? Yes. And yeah. that will just allow you to bank up money and scale even faster. Right. Yes. Um, yep. And then you can break free when you want to break yeah. free. You know? So Knowing what you know now, what would you have done differently back in, you know, looking back 2006, getting out of school? Just like everybody, you know, wish you had gotten started sooner, yeah, yeah, <laughs> especially yeah. at that time. I mean, yeah. my goodness, if I would have started uh, buying things in 2008, 2009. That'd be, <laughs> that'd be excellent. So, uh, you know, that's the biggest thing. Exactly. I mean, even now, you know, there's always a good time and a bad time depending on the market cycles, but sure. you know, there's never, I shouldn't say maybe never, but I don't think it's ever a wrong time if you have your goals clear and you're, and you're disciplined. So, I mean, I know there's a lot of, uncertainty and speculation on what's going to happen with the real estate market now interest rates going up you yep. know prices of the properties are going crazy yep. and a lot of people are getting pretty scared of what may come and you know by no means do i have a crystal ball but um i still feel that there's definitely deals out there that again if you're disciplined and do your numbers and what makes sense for you yep. that it's not a bad time to get started even now yeah when it comes to, you know, building a, building your business and surrounding it around your lifestyle, what does it look like going forward for you? What does this year look like? And, you know, look, looking at a year or two or three years, what's it look like? Yeah. Well, my immediate goal this year is still to, to leave the W2 and, you know, the plan was to leave that sooner, but uh, because it's these, these medical issues are extending, um, yeah. you know, mainly for the health insurance, insurance. reasons where, yep. where you know, we're yep. sticking with it. Yep. So as soon as that clears up enough, then, you know, the plan is to quit the W2. And from a, an investing perspective, I am still looking to actively acquire some more short-term rentals. You know, my plan is, is for maybe another two to three. And then I do want to shift focus to some more passive investments. Hmm. You know, I kind of get my eye more so on, on some larger multifamily or, or self-storage uh, through syndication. So I'm starting to kind of dabble in the research on those asset classes now, but for the time being, yeah, I want to continue to bolster that, that cash flow a bit more and then start that transition into some more passive, uh, passive activities. Yeah, it's great. Let's just, I want to move uh, to the final segment, what I call for, for impact. Uh, your favorite quote, uh, I want to build a life that I don't need to take a vacation from. What to, to, to the author's unknown, but what about that resonates with you? I think a lot of people who are in those W-2 jobs yeah. that, you know, you can tend to feel kind of stuck, right? Which is why people want that, you know, they desire the freedom of when you break free from it, because I mean, especially in this, in this country and the, the mentality is uh, work, work, work. Right. And it's, yep. it's almost kind of looked down upon when you take a vacation, Yeah. Uh, which, which, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of sad. That's just the way, you know, it is here. Yep. Uh, so yeah. When you're working that, that life, you know, what, what do you do? You work Monday through Friday, looking forward to that weekend. Yeah. Right. And then Sunday evening comes and you're all stressed because now you're looking at Monday. Yeah. Right. And then you're looking for that, maybe that one week vacation you have two, three months down the road. Yeah. And then it's going to be another six, nine months before you get another one week. And yeah. it's just, again, that's one of the motivations for wanting to break free from the W2 for me. So yeah, to me, that, that's what that quote means is building that, that life of freedom where you don't need to live for a weekend. You don't need to live for yeah. a vacation that, you know, every day is the kind of day that, that you want it to be. Have you always had that perspective balance relative to work or has your wife, the fact that she's not from here and that, that culturally it's extraordinarily different relative to the American culture, right? You had a profound impact on your, on your viewpoint there. So yeah, by nature, I'm very hardworking. And, you know, so to me, work is very important. Discipline is very important. Responsibility is very important. I have a hard time. It has a negative is that, you know, I'm, I have a hard time resting. 
right? Yep. Um, which can be a challenge. But uh, yeah, I, you know, definitely, you know, she's from Ecuador and, you know, prior to even us being together, you know, I'd done a lot of traveling in South America yeah. and yeah, I just fell in love with that culture. Like you, like you alluded to, it's a very, very different, very, very much more lighthearted and family and, and family. friend yeah. focused yep. than work or money focused. Yeah. And so, yeah, that culture is just a lot more vibrant. I'm definitely very drawn to that and uh, I want to get my life a little bit more, more like that. Their pyramid of values, if you will, looks very different than the, the traditional U.S. pyramid of values. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, if I can, uh, just <laughs> another, another quote that I came upon just yeah. this past week, which is fantastic. I, I loved it. Is uh, it's actually from Steve Harvey. He said that instead of constantly telling God how big your problems are, you need to start telling your problems how big your God is. Ooh, yeah, yeah, right. When he said that, I was like, oh my gosh, like that is convicting. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, right. Yeah, and uh, I guess I just heard that this this past week, and I've been like thinking about that so much, and it's so so powerful. And, and from a mindset perspective. And so I wanted to share that because yeah, that, that just, that hit me when I heard that. I'm like, yeah. Oh my gosh, that needs, I need to work on that. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's tremendous. Yeah. My second question, what do you think holds most investors back from hitting their, their personal next level, whatever that is? I think it's always fear. Yeah. Fear, of, fear of yeah, many different things. Yeah. Uh, it's different for everybody. I mean, uh, when you're first getting started, a lot of it, I think is the fear of the unknown, right? You don't yeah. know what you're getting into. Right. There's, there's a lot of risk involved. Once you get started, I think those fears change. And frankly, I'm, I'm kind of in a period where, you know, I've gotten to a certain level of, of success Yes. that like the next on the next step seems so much bigger and, mm. and it, it, you almost, it, it is almost like a fear of success um, in a sense and feeling like you're not you're not worthy, worthy. Of getting to that next level. Right. So I'm kind of in that dealing with that right now myself, but uh, yeah, I think it's just fear of different, different aspects and, and that changes, you know, for each person and what stage you're, you're in. Isn't that so weird because it's uh, that's simply an emotion, right? Right. There's no grounded logic in the fact that we, we as individuals shouldn't be allowed to get whatever success comes our way or whatever we create for ourselves. It doesn't matter what it is. Right. right. Yeah. Each time I get invited on podcasts, like I honestly, I don't feel worthy of being on them. You know, I hear, I listen to the other guests and things like that and hear these great stories and, and all these great success things. And, you know, I look at my path and where I'm at and, and again, part of it's a personal, a personal thing and, you know, looking at yourself and saying, oh, well, you know, you're not good enough. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, I still struggle with that. I struggle with that a lot. Part of that is to churn what you just said into fuel. Right. That propels yourself and probably, or you already know that probably what largely what contributes to your work ethic. Right. But yeah, then not, exactly. but then wherever it rubs on a negative standpoint, you got to yeah. lean in and figure out how to, how to overcome it one way or another. Right. And that's exactly it. You know, and, and again, everybody, everybody is going to have some type of struggle, some type of fear, some type of Correct. excuse, and it's a matter of what you do with it. Just like you said, you know, you can either let that determine your, your path and your future and beat you down, or you can put your, you know, put your nose down and, and just put in the work and, and bust through it and prove that you can do it. And that you are worth it. Yeah. Outside of real estate, what are you most passionate about? Fitness and traveling. The gym is important for me, keeping healthy. Um, you know, like I'd mentioned earlier, you know, I, I, I get up super early now and go to the gym, uh, which, uh, I'm not a morning person still to this day, but yeah. you know, it's just out of necessity. So uh, it's not just from the physical aspect, but it's just kind of, I've been doing it for so long now that it's, it helps. It's kind of like a sanity check, you know, special, especially with everything going on, you know, it, yeah. it just kind of helps, helps uh, regulate things, you know, yep. um, and then traveling, uh, which again is, you know, part of that, that why of wanting the freedom. I love traveling. I just, I've always had this kind of wanderlust and, um, I've been to 20, you know, 20 different countries over the years. And like I said, I've traveled extensively in South America. That's kind of my favorite, favorite area. So you know, wherever I go now, that's kind of, I go down to South America. So I, I love traveling. I want to be able to do that more. I want to get the, the kids to be able to, you know, do that more and have experiences. And so it's, 
funny when I think about things because, you know, I grew up in a small town in New Hampshire, you know, a little country boy. And to think, you know, to look back and look at where I am now, it's just interesting to me, you know, because again, a small town, New Hampshire, a small town, a lot of places, a lot of people end up staying there. Right. Yep. And there's very few people that actually break free, quote unquote, you know, and, and venture out. So I don't know. I just kind of look at myself a little bit as, a, as an anomaly in that sense of, you know, coming from that type of upbringing and then to where I am now and being as adventurous, having that wanderlust, you know, going to the places, having the experiences I've had, you know, it's just, I just find it interesting when I look back over my, my path, you know? Yeah. Wouldn't have guessed. Right. Yeah. Right. Tell me what's your, uh, what's your favorite way to make an impact in the community? Right now it's trying to help other people. What I say, what I call see the light, you know, of, yeah. of how you can, how you can have this, this freedom, like how you can make it a reality. In fact, I mean, just, just before this, this podcast year, I was um, a lunch meeting with, he's actually is a, a work colleague that, you know, I've become friends with over the, over the past several years. Sure. And, um, you know, he's, I've shared, you know, with him where I'm at and, and talked about real estate with him and he's, he's got an interest. He just doesn't know how to necessarily get started. What the entry point is, right? Right. Just talking with him, helping, you know, showing him what the possibilities are, or what the yeah. pathways are. And, you know, same thing. A lot of people, you know, have reached out to me, um, you know, from the various podcasts or from the forums that I'm on and asking again, how I've, how I've gotten to where I am, what would you do here? You know, can you help me with this? So, I just find it very, it's, it's fulfilling and satisfying to be able to help people grow and, and help people, you know, break free and, and find that freedom that they're looking for. And so, you know, that's really, I want to say it's, it's a, a, you know, a true, I don't know if it's true passion of mine, but it's just, it's something that has really drawn me to the real estate industry yeah. as well as that it's such a very sharing and yep. plentiful mindset uh, industry. Yeah the only one that I can think of where everybody is so willing to help and, and share and help bring other people up. It's pretty amazing. And so, you know, I was able to help, you know, help other people in that same regard. Yeah, no, that's, that's tremendous. Well, you definitely have a tremendous, unique personal story and, and candidly a personal struggle that almost none of us ever face or will ever face. To, and and to have the intestinal fortitude to forge forward, knowing that you know certain things are out of your hands, if you will, and to control what it is that you can control, and remember why you started in the first place, right. and to let that be, to let that be the fuel that has lit your fire and continues to do so. It's right. it's a wonderful story, and and to think that you're doing this all while working at W two. This is yeah. what you, what you've described in the replacement of W2 income is your side hustle. Right. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, that is tremendous. And uh, you deserve tremendous credit and you're not giving yourself enough because it's a wonderful story and in rare atmosphere for those who are actually able to achieve it because doing it is, is nothing like talking about it. Right. So my, my hat's off to you for the success you've had and where you're, where you're headed, the impact you're making in your family and sharing your story, because I know from who I interact with in the community that this story and, uh, will make a tremendous impact in, in people's lives. It's, it's, it's inspirational. Right. I, I appreciate that. And, um, you know, I, I just, I do need to, uh, you know, share and if, if I may, you know, I, I I am a man of faith. Um, and so, you know, I, I do feel I've been very blessed throughout, you know, this whole journey and these whole, all these challenges. And you know, I think my faith has played a big, a big part in that. And yeah. like you said, that understanding that things are, some things are going to be out of my hands and that you just have to release that. So, you know, uh, I do give the, uh, the, the praise and, and glory to God for helping me through this. Yeah. If people want to connect, they want to find you, they want to follow you uh, online, wherever, what, what's the best way or how can they in multiple ways do so? Uh, Facebook is the best way. You, know, you can find just Kale Bellini and, uh, you know, like I said, I'm active, very active in a few different uh, real estate specific forums. Uh, but yeah, feel free excuse me, to reach out to me just through Facebook and Instagram. You know, I'm, I, we, <laughs> I do have an account for my, my 
properties and personally, but yeah. honestly, I, I'm almost never on it. So yeah. you can find me there, but probably I may not respond for a while. Yeah, there you, there you <laughs> so go. Facebook is the best. I'll make sure we get the, the link to Facebook here in the, in the show notes. Yeah. Kale, thanks for coming on and, and sharing your story. It's really been great. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Neil. Absolutely. Hey, for everybody here at Real Grit, I'm Neil Timmons, reminding you that real estate requires real grit. I'll see you next time. If you like our content and want more, you can access it at realgritpodcast.com. You hear it guest after guest. Instinctively, you already know it. But let me call it out. The most expensive action is inaction. The real estate market is full of opportunities. You just need to uncover them. You can build a business that lasts for years, makes monumental impact in the lives of those that you love. It's not just about business, but about the freedom you get because of it. Have you ever heard the saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I believe that partnering is essential. In fact, I partner with hardworking investors all the time. The point is that you can get a lot further with the right partner. Let me say it again, the right partner. If you've ever thought about partnering with anyone or if you have a partner now, I encourage you to download my free Partner and Profit Guide, which includes the top five must answer questions to evaluate a profitable partnership. You can find it at www.legacyimpactpartners.com. I'll see you in the next episode.